but words won't build homes. Tonight on our century, the great Aussie dream. Whether it's the posh palace by the water or dependable fibro, Aussies will do anything for their own piece of real estate. As the endorsed Democratic candidate for Lane Cove, I maintain that after the war, every citizen should be able to acquire a home of his own. Uh, what do you think of this cost? Well, we loan up to 90% of the total land and house value. Oh yes, they may have to wait, but their turn will come. They'll know the thrill of a home of their own, for that is their birthright. The housing estate, it's a real Australian obsession. While the rest of the world rents, we buy. More than two out of three Australians have bought their own house or are flat out paying it off. And nobody matches us when it comes to home ownership. And we've always done it. At the beginning of our century at Federation, home ownership in Australia was three times that of Mother England. And every decade since, it's been every young couple's dream. Work hard, build a house, and live happily ever after. Meet newlyweds Paul and Iris Ruckett. They're starting out on that adventure of a lifetime. Paul had popped the question in his car as they watched the lights of Brisbane from Kangaroo Point. Iris was just 17. You're going to get to know the Ruckets pretty well over the next half hour, thanks to this little toy. Paul has recorded every chapter of their lives together on a home movie. A remarkable movie that was 56 years in the making. This empty block at Norman Park is the Ruckett's slice of heaven. It's 1942, and everything is rationed because of the war. Paul and Iris are only allowed to spend 50 pounds a year on building materials. For the time being, at least, Home Sweet Home was a simple shed with a perfect white picket fence. The great Aussie dream of owning your own patch goes back to the start of the century and beyond. Funny thing is, the houses were built for English conditions. Victorian terraces and Federation homes with a steep pitch roof to keep the sleet and the snow off. Not exactly necessary in Australia. But whatever the shape, in 1900 housing was affordable. It had cost you about a quarter of your weekly wage to pay off a suburban home. And in 1918, when the diggers came back from the war, the government knew its duty. There were generous war service loans so that everyone could have a home of their own. New suburbs were growing along the train and the tram lines. And why would you choose a crowded city terrace when there was plenty of room in the suburbs for a Californian bungalow with a garden front and back? The quarter acre block had arrived. <laughs> what a welcome caller in the hot weather is the Ice Man, bringing health and comfort with every block of ice. Whether you lived in the suburbs or the city, the home felt like the centre of the universe, because everyone, it seemed, came to your front door. The butcher, the baker, the grocer, the rabbito. and the rag and bone and bottler. He paid a few pence for everything that you wanted to throw away. Then there was the time payment collector. He came banging on your door for the next instalment on the wireless. One shilling and sixpence. 
The wireless didn't sit on the furniture. It was the furniture. See who that is. Oh, it's the landlord. Welcome my way, child. I want my rent. <laughs> and this wonderful gadget was now a link to the outside world. Always pay your rent. But in 1929, the wireless brought news that we didn't want to hear. The stock market had crashed on Wall Street and the shock waves rolled in across the Pacific, sending Australians into a sea of depression. 30% unemployment, foreclosures and evictions. They were some of the cruelest times of the century. In normal times, 30% of Australia's working population has a hand in making homes. The depression brought our building industry and the great Aussie dream to a grinding halt. It stayed that way for years. Democratic candidate for Lane Cove, I maintain that after the war, every citizen should be able to acquire a home of his own with money provided at an interest rate not exceeding 2%. 1945, the end of that other war. Aussies approach the second half of the century with fresh optimism. Most of us live in the average type of Australian house, which costs us about one day's pay a week. These suburbs are compact, but every house has a garden back and front. This film paints a rosy picture. But if you were trying to build a new home in the 1940s and 50s, it was a very different story. Brick, timber and corrugated iron were all in short supply, which also made them quite expensive. So builders recycled bricks from demolition sites and they experimented with chipboard and with fibro. A research department testing new building materials will add variety and economy to homes dispatched all over the state. Overseas, these were used to build factories and makeshift office blocks. But in Australia, fibro became the stuff that dreams are made of. Remember our friends the Ruckets? Well, in 1945, there was a new face at Norman Park. Baby Marie Anne arrives in time to see the first frames of the Fibro Mansion start to go up. Typically tropical, it's a Queensland, up on stilts and away from the floods, away from the white ants and the hot earth below. Paul spends every spare hour working on the house and every spare penny buying film for his camera. As a kid, he used to love Laurel and Hardy. And now Paul and Iris are working on their own double act. By the late 40s, the baby boom was in full production. But the housing industry couldn't keep up with demand. Australia was experiencing growing pains. A family of two adults and three children live in this one-roomed flat. Not much of a home to feel proud of. In just a decade, we welcomed two million new Australians, and half of those were migrants. But in hard-pressed Australia, still getting over the strain of World War II, there simply weren't enough houses to go around. Thousands more home seekers are arriving from overseas. But today, immigration means more camps, more congestion. Not a very happy way to start life in a new country. So they lived in sheds and in corrugated iron Nissan huts. Not much to look at from outside. But comfortable inside. The great Aussie dream must have seemed a long way off to these new arrivals. In fact, the news was bad for anyone looking for their first home. Kathy wants to get married, but Ted wants to wait until they've got a decent place to live. Look, Kathy, you've got to be sensible about these things. But if we just keep on waiting around until the right place comes along, we, we could wait forever. I know a lot of couples just like us who decided to take the plunge. They found places, all right. Stinking single rooms and thankful to get them. Young couples would beg or borrow for a block of land and then use that as bank security for a home loan. But here's the catch. The loan often took years to come through, so you had to live in mum and dad's garage or in the back shed. We've gone out of our plan. Uh, what do you think it has cost? 
Have you got the land? Yeah, it cost us 100 quid. Well, we loan up to 90% of the total land and house value. Payments would be about 27 and 6 a week over 21 years. New suburbs spring up on the outskirts, such as Elizabeth in Adelaide, Ashburton in Melbourne, and Melville in Perth. At least 50 schemes where planning has become a reality are already underway throughout Australia. Brisbane and Hobart have their master plans, and scores of housing commission projects are taking shape in most states. Years later, we'd call it suburban sprawl. But these new developments seem to be the answer to the housing crisis. They keep driving us away Across the western suburbs We must wander Where is the house The little terrace house In the city used to be In the 20 years after World War II Home ownership made its biggest jump of the century Seven out of ten Aussies Now had their foot in the front door And inside that front door You'd find all the trappings Of 60s suburbia Jim was bursting with pride over the effect of our curtains when he'd hung them. We called it interior design. Black curtains, flying ducks on the walls, and the mementos of an exotic holiday. As for the ruckets, well, the Queenslander had its own special charm. There was no six o'clock closing in this house. But the crowning glory was in the backyard. Paul built himself Wait for it, a cement pond. The arrival of Graham and Michael brings the racket population to five. And notice how this proud dad manages to get his beloved pond into every home move. There's nothing quite like having all the mod cons. This is a house that's different, as modern as next century. For instance, when Dad gets home from business, he just presses the front doorbell and the phone rings. Mother answers, finds out who it is, and if he's brought home any of his pals from the club. No, dear, I'm all alone. Okay, then, she presses a button and Dad can walk right in. Please explain why Dad didn't just use his front door key. It's a house of gadgets, all right, and it has its own intercom system. Dad doesn't have to yell at the kids, there's a loudspeaker in their bedroom. Careful, son. Dad can hear back chat, too. As a federal authority, has the right to purchase property compulsory. And as far as I can see, you have offered no evidence to refute that right. No evidence? It's not a house, it's a home. A man's home is his castle. I mean, it's, it's, it's Jack's castle, it's for... Farouk's castle? Daryl Kerrigan is a battler defending his castle and the way of life that's uniquely Australian. Shot, Dale. Oh, Steve, could you move the Chimera? I need to get the Tirana out so I can get to the Commodore. I'll have to get the keys to Cortina. I'm going to move that Chimera. Yeah, watch the boat, mate. Building a free and easy lifestyle is just as important to the great Aussie dream as bricks and mortar. Before you buy a mower, why not ring your nearest Victor agent or call on him? He's there to help you and will gladly arrange a demonstration on your own lawn without obligation. In 1952, this Aussie invention took the pain out of a weekend ritual. Now we're all together, let's turn grass into lawn the easy Victor way. The time we saved on household chores like mowing the lawn could be spent on serious fun. Hey Dal, almost finished. Chop some wood for the barbie, will you? Rich or poor, entertaining is one of the pleasures of the great Aussie dream. This is when we let the drawbridge down and show off our castle. Living here is easy and informal, and the temperate climate makes entertaining out of doors an all the year round possibility. Sunday morning cocktails and conversation, after a surf and sunbathe. It's difficult to be dull in a place like this. And there's never a dull moment in the Rucket household. Graham turns 21. Dad tries to work out how he's going to pay for his daughter's wedding. And you guessed it, everyone ends up in the cement pond. 
In the mid-60s, if you had a backyard pool, well, you'd made it. Especially in the new suburbs, which were getting further and further away from the beach. It was one of life's little ironies. Your average backyard pool took as much water to fill it as 4,000 flushes of the toilet. That's if you're lucky enough to have one. In 1960, when the demand for swimming pools was taking off, one in three houses didn't have a flush toilet. Even in the 70s, the dunny man was still a weekly visitor to hundreds of thousands of Aussie homes. Some call it the drum, others call it the pan. And still others, well, they dug their own. And this is what dreams were made of. Having your own house with your own number on it. Green Valley. A social experiment. A suburb virtually created overnight. In the early 60s, the rush for new homes hit fever pitch. Money was flowing, even if the main sewerage wasn't. Tens of thousands of families were thrown together into prefab suburbs like Green Valley. But not much thought went into the quality of life that they were buying into. An expert on loneliness has estimated that loneliness has increased by 18.7% since the valley was first settled. This film from the early 70s was a send-up of all the bad news stories that came out of these outer suburbs. It was put together by a talented young filmmaker named Peter Weir. The experiment has been a failure. Yes, we may have to face evacuation. Now, it was never this bad. But for a while there in the 60s, the great Aussie dream nearly became the great Australian ugliness. Trees gave way to a tangled mess of telegraph poles and the houses all looked the same. So we added a few personal touches of our own. Here in Melbourne, this proud homeowner is busily burning off his only tree. It will probably be replaced with a shrub trimmed into the shape of an emu. Eventually, we learned from our mistakes. Planting trees and putting power lines underground. Peter Weir, of course, found fame in Hollywood. Meanwhile, up in Norman Park, the rocket show keeps rolling on. And since the war, the great Aussie dream has come the full circle for two generations of the rocket family. And today, Paul and Iris are still living the good life in the home that they built with such wonderful memories. Oh, well, those days are gone. Oh, I don't know. Somebody walked by there now and flipped a bit of water. It could be on again. Mm. <laughs> These were homes, uninhabitable now. Most of them will have to be demolished. And the owners, with their life savings gone, will have to start again. There is no insurance against flood. It is called an act of God. No one expects it to happen to them. But nothing shatters the great Aussie dream more suddenly than an act of God. Flood, bushfire, cyclone and earthquake. We've had the lot. What makes people determined that when the water falls, they'll go back again? Nothing more or less than that magic word, home. So why do we do it? The great Aussie dream has been interrupted by two world wars, the Great Depression, and any number of natural disasters. And yet today and tomorrow and the next day, 300 Aussies will take a deep breath and buy their first property. My tracks are down to sell, and a 3.35 second, that'll find the floor, hold on, have a great thing. Yo! Ten years ago, Australians would borrow twice their annual income for a home loan. Now we borrow three times what we earn. When the stock market crashed in 1987, it revived people's faith in bricks and mortar. And today, the banks and the building societies are falling over themselves to give everyone a home loan. So at this twilight end of our century, the great Aussie dream is still alive and well. It's just changed a bit. We're much more mobile now, 
a quarter of us move house every year. So even if we do switch and swap, at the end of the day, it's still about security. And it's about having your own place. That's important to us. Owning your own home seems to make life complete. And after all, everyone loves a happy ending. There's a light burning bright in my homeland tonight By the window of an old Australian home And the girl who understands is waiting for a mountain man By the light in the old Australian home There's a light, there's a light, there's a light, there's a light There's a light, there's a light, there's a light in the window of an old Australian home